My name is Scott Bobby, and this afternoon I'm going to speak about my involvement in the Guinness Affair, which took place in the ten years or so from the late 1970s, and which was probably the first major criminal prosecution in financial affairs in the period up to that date. I was involved in this through being a partner in Wood Mackenzie, which was a Scottish firm. We'd expanded and built a, an office in London in the mid-1970s and grew, grown very fast. We covered, research-wise, a number of sectors, one of which was the brewing sector. One uh, afternoon, my analyst colleague David Campbell and I went to visit Guinness, and we found that um, things really were not at all good. There was very little management, the costs were out of control, and the business had no uh, real fix on the 150 or so small subsidiary companies that they had built, had bought out of the cash flow of their basic brewing business. David wrote a very critical document which criticised the company. And within the next 18 months, the things that we had said might happen came to fruition. The company had a downturn. Uh, there was serious doubt about the future of the dividend, which had been an important factor in investors buying the stock. And the management uh, at that time, which was almost wholly Guinness family, decided they had to do something about it. They recruited Ernest Saunders, who had been a, an executive at um, Nestle and before that at Beecham. Um, he uh, quite quickly decided that he needed more management support and control, and he hired a firm of management consultants called Bain, who in turn put a man called Olivier Roux in charge of servicing this account. Olivier was an extremely able and competent individual and became effectively finance director of the company. Ernest Saunders, before he joined the company, um, was in the, had a period of garden leave, and he sat on the beach and read all sorts of material about Guinness. One of the things he read was our document, which led him to think he should maybe come and see us. So we had conversations with him, and in um, early 1984, he recruited us as the company's corporate broker. Um, we worked with them, and um, in 1985, we worked with them in the, on the acquisition of Bell's Scotch Whiskey. We were supplemented as corporate broker by Kazanov, who did the dealing side, who supervised the dealing and trading side of the transaction. Uh, the lead merchant banking advisor was Morgan Renfell. We always knew this, that Distillers Company, long term, was an Ernest Saunders uh, views. Soon after Guinness had bought Distillers, uh, had bought Bells, Argyle began to look increasingly carefully at Distillers. Argyle was at that time was a chain retail supermarket. Um, by about the end of 1985, Argyle had decided it wanted to bid for Distillers, and in fact, at the in December of that year, they mounted a bid. The Stillers Company were very unhappy about that and persuaded Guinness to act as White Knight and bid for the company, which they did do so in about, at about the end of January in 1986. This was an unusual bid because um, Distillers had agreed to pay for the Guinness cost of acquisition and furthermore um, they had agreed to set a, head, a new head office for a joint company in Scotland and to appoint a chairman whose name was Tom Risk and who was governor of the Bank of Scotland. Morgan Grenfell appointed a much more aggressive guy to run the bid situation called Roger Selig was perhaps the best known merchant banker of his time. Um, and uh, Guinness brought much more into the, into the scene. An old affiliate of Ernest Saunders called Tom Ward, who was an American, with whom he'd worked at Nestle, and who was um, partner in a law firm in Washington, US. The 
bid for the sellers continued for about three months. Uh, there were various in and outs, but eventually the company uh, was won. And in about uh, April 86, Guinness was able to announce it had won the battle for distillers. We didn't hear much more after that, um, but um, about in about July, we were approached by, by Tom Risk, who said that um, the company had informed him they no longer wished that he should be chairman, and in fact they were not going to have a head office in Scotland. He became very perturbed about all that, um, and uh, we had a long series of uh, debates and arguments with various advisers, uh, the result of which was we had to say to Guinness that unless Risk was appointed chairman, we as a broking firm would resign from his account. He didn't listen to us and we did resign. Um, as a result of our resignation, there was a, an agreement made that uh, although Ernest Saunders would himself become chairman, they would appoint four independent non-executive directors who would have the power to appoint the chairman who'd have all sorts of powers and so on. And this was eventually agreed by a special EGM of the company, which took place in September. Come um, about uh, November time, we were sitting very quietly in the office when two guys came in one morning very early and said, we are DTI inspectors. We've come to investigate Guinness would you kindly let us have your personal diaries and all sorts of things? This was uh, had been uh, brought upon because uh, one of the people with whom Guinness had um, uh, persuaded to had paid to act to buy stock in Guinness to support the price was uh, Ivan Boski, who was a very well known U.S. arbitrageur. Boski had uh, was under investigation by the FBI. And in the last six weeks of freedom, he agreed he would wear a wire or a tape recording so that all his transactions and discussions could be recorded. In fact, uh, the discussion with Guinness on the aftermath and how he was to be paid for the help he'd given was all recorded. And this came back to the UK. At the same time, the auditors had begun to question the in huge payments that had been made to cover the cost of the transaction. So... To cut a very long story short, um, the, um, the company eventually sacked Ernest uh, and um, the DTI inspectors conducted various inquiries uh, and at the same time the prosecution authorities began to, to um, investigate this very carefully, we believe due to the interest of Mrs Thatcher. Uh, at, 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 um, um, I, in fact, became involved as a witness in, in, the, in the trial. Um, the, the, there were supposed to be three trials. The first trial concerned Ernest Saunders, plus um, a man called Jack Lyons. So Jack Lyons, who had been assisting uh, Bain and Company, the management consultants, and had assisted Saunders, and had basically... Um, been very involved in masterminding some at least of the share buying. A man called Tony Parnes, who we did, we, of whom we were totally unaware and had been, uh, had been assisting also Guinness, was a stockbroker, worked on what we call the half commission basis and he was also assisting the, the, um, the, the um, purchasing of shares. The other accused was General Ronson, who is Heron Corporation, extremely well-known financier, who had been persuaded to put money into this, again, illicitly to back these shares against an indemnity by Guinness. So they were all put on trial. Um, I was a prosecution witness for that trial. A second trial took place, should have taken place later, which was Roger Selig, who was the head, um, head trader at Morgan Grenfell, and a man called uh, Spence, Lord Spence from Ansbacher, who'd also been involved in illicit purchase. In fact, um, the trial was eventually cancelled because Selig had a nervous breakdown 
whilst defending himself. Whether he had or not, I'm not sure, but he had a nervous breakdown and the trial was cancelled. A third trial was also propagated, which involved David Mayhew of Kaznov, but that never actually took place. So the main trial was the four accused. I took part as a prosecution witness. The trial lasted about two months. I spent about a day in the witness box, and most of the time I was involved um, was in giving people, giving the jury advice and guidance on how the stock exchange worked and how share trading and so on worked. Um, I was seen as a, as a good guy, if you like. So I um, gave my evidence and um, really heard no more after that. Well, the outcome of the trial was that uh, Saunders was jailed for five years. Ronson and Pans for uh, two years, and Jack Lyons, who was well into his 70s, was not jailed, but uh, lost his knighthood as part of the, as part of the um, penalty. Saunders eventually was released after 10 months because his health had given up. There was a lot of discussion that he feigned dementia. I don't think that was true. I think there was, um, somebody said it might be early dementia. One of the doctors had said it might be early dementia, but I don't think he had dementia at all. He was extremely depressed. He was extremely ill, I think, at the time in, in prison, as I think any of us would be, even in Ford Open Prison. So that's what happened over Saunders. Um, the footnote was that the DTR inspection, which had begun in 1986, published eventually in 1997, and gave the greatest detail about the share manipulation and the art and the share purchasing which had taken place. The uh, share, the bid for distillers, was in a combination of a modest amount of cash and um, a substantial amount of Guinness shares. The higher the Guinness shares, the better the offer. And it was important that Guinness should sustain that price. What the DTI inspectors found was that... Um, the um, distiller's share price uh, in the last two or three weeks of the bid had risen by 19% at a time when the market itself rose by 0.2%. And they discovered that 25% of the, sh of the uh, market capitalisation of the shares in issue of Guinness had been bought under artificial circumstances. So it was a massive share uh, price manipulation scheme, which of course explains why the price rose so sharply and why Guinness was able to buy distillers. Subsequently, of course, um, the company has become part of Diageo Group and, and is trading very successfully, and Guinness is, is part of that. But it was an extremely ex interesting um, experience as far as I was concerned, and I think it was ex um, relevant because it was just at the start of the, um, just at the time of Big Bang, and it did preempt some of the um, regulatory initiatives that were taken at, at, at that time.